six lucky to have uh, Professor Devaruti Chatterjee from Ayuka Pune. Professor Chatterjee did her undergrad from uh, St. Javier's College and uh, uh, postgraduate from uh, Science College. And then uh, she did her PhD from Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics. And then she was uh, she was a Humboldt Fellow at University of Heidelberg and a postdoc at Paris Observatory, then a CNRS researcher, CNRS scientist in another institution in France before uh, she came back to India and became a faculty member at Ayuka. Um, she is a professor that is a part of the international LIGO collaboration, which has more than a thousand. Uh, scientists from all over the world, uh, and in particular uh, in the LIGO India collaboration, uh, which some of you may know, uh, got uh, 2,600 crores of funding in the beginning of last year. Um, so uh, she is the chair of, uh, apart from being a scientist in the LIGO India collaboration, she's also the chair of the uh, education and outreach cell of LIGO India. So if you have any innovative projects related to that, you can contact her. Um, uh, Professor Chatterjee's research is about modeling of uh, both analytical and computational modeling of um, compact objects and their comparison with uh, multiple observations, multi messenger observations. As you know, inside of uh, compact objects, the physical conditions uh, like the density and temperature are extreme and cannot be replicated in. Uh, uh, you know, terrestrial laboratories. So, neutron stars and black holes and, you know, other compact objects, they are the only uh, sort of uh, experimental laboratory where these theories can be tested. And she works on that. Um, so, that's the introduction. And about the story, uh, there is, so we always tell a story, but <laughs> so to figure out the story. Um, so, as I think this has happened before, but uh, it's the, the, the same uh, similar story is uh, that she was in the same batch uh, of uh, physics, BSc and MSc as uh, me and SC ma'am and SSR are in the Kolkata area. Uh, but we did not know her at the time. We knew several of her friends from St. Javier's mm -hmm. and Science College, but we did not personally know her. But that's as well because you don't have to know everyone in Kolkata studying physics now because 20 years from now, you will be a faculty member somewhere else and she will be a faculty member somewhere else and then she will come to give a talk and you will come to know that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that you were actually studying physics in within five kilometers of each other uh, mm -hmm. for three years. So with that, Professor Chat. Thank you so much. Thanks, firstly, to Vitavan for inviting me to come here. It's a real pleasure for me and also for having me here. So um, it's a great pleasure for me, uh, again, to, to meet you all. I think the last time I was in this building was when I was a student. So it's been many years that I, I had to write in the admission test. Probably. <laughs> But I was applying for physiology or something. Oh, really? yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah. So today, um, um, I will try to give you a little bit of flavor about this uh, very uh, novel field of astronomy that has opened up very recently in the past decade. And uh, so all of you are already in the school of astrophysics, so I don't need to um, motivate you. Uh, to, to know more about astronomy, but I want to give you the flavor of how multidisciplinary this entire, uh, this new field is. So, um, yeah, so I, I think you all know me, Devarate, uh, so I am associate professor at Ayuka in Pune, and I'm a member of the LIGO scientific collaboration, LIGO India <laughs> collaboration, and LIGO India project. I will tell you a little bit more about it as, as we go on. So, um, Right. So I think already Ritavan gave you a little bit of motivation of why we are, why I am so motivated to study this field. So um, I'm basically a nuclear and particle physicist. So I am interested to know what is the fundamental composition of matter around us. 
So usually what people do is if you want to probe deep into something, you go to higher energy physics, you want to probe deeper into the composition, the inner composition of, of objects. So what we usually do is we look towards terrestrial experiments like nuclear experiments. There are also hypernuclear experiments. I will tell you a little bit more about them. There are heavy ion collision experiments like the one going on at CERN. So all these particle accelerators, they smash these uh, high energy beams and the, from the scattering of the particles that are produced from the particle tracks, they, they trace the properties of the, of the particles. So this is the kind of physics that we can prove currently with the best of the facilities that we have. But what if I tell you that nature has already given us something that helps us to understand much deeper into particle physics and nuclear physics than we can ever achieve with these terrestrial experiments. So I'm talking about compact stars. So these are these compact objects which are formed at the end point of evolution of massive stars. So usually stars you are called our astronomy students. So you know that normal stars like the sun, they go through an evolutionary process and end up as objects called white dwarfs. And what I will be talking about in this talk is mostly neutron stars. So these are again compact objects which have very peculiar properties. So the masses of these objects are around one to two times that of the sun, but confined within a very small radius of only 10 kilometers. Imagine taking the sun and crushing it to only 10 kilometers. So you can imagine from back of the envelope calculation, you can see the densities will be enormous, right? So a spoonful of matter will be like tons of, you know, what we can produce here on Earth. So basically to give you an idea, the densities in the interior can go from two to 10 times that that we have usually in the terrestrial laboratories. So there is no machine on Earth which can probe these kind of densities. So that naturally makes compact stars cosmic laboratories to understand fundamental physics. Not only that, the neutron stars show many peculiar features. They have very cold temperature, very low temperatures. I mean, usually we think 10 to the 9, 10 to the 11 Kelvin, which is like 1 MeV. This is a hot object. But actually, if you look at the, the uh, energies of the particles themselves, you will understand that these are very low temperatures compared to the energies of the particles forming this star. So they, these objects also show very peculiar features like superfluidity and superconductivity. Also, magnetic fields inside neutron stars are very, very high. So imagine the, the, the sun has a magnetic field and then you are compressing it. And because of the conservation of um, the magnetic flux, the, the magnetic field blows up. So typically neutron stars have about 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 Gauss magnetic fields, which is very high. There are even some objects called magnetars. These are ultra magnetized neutron stars. They can have fields as high as 10 to the power 15 at the surface and inside they might have 10 to the power 18 Gauss. So this is by far the strongest magnetic field we have ever encountered in the universe. So all this makes neutron stars a very, very attractive candidate to, to explore, right? So this is the, the kind of picture we have in mind. So a normal sun, a normal star, a massive star goes through an evolutionary cycle. Uh, the ones you are probably learning now in stellar evolution. And then at the end point of evolution, what happens is it ends up as a compact object. So basically, when the it runs out of nuclear fuel that supports the star against gravitational collapse, then there is nothing else we can think of. So it will collapse towards the center. There is a rebound. The, the layers are blown out into, into a sp stellar space, producing magnificent supernova explosions. If you go to the internet, you will see beautiful images of supernova explosions. And in the end, there is um, a remnant sitting at the center, and this is typically a neutron star. So um, just to go into a little bit of the interesting history. So for white dwarfs, what happened was, in the beginning, people found the uh, closest and white, uh, brightest white dwarf, Sirius B. And from that observation, they found its compactness, and they realized it was a very compact object. 
and they started to wonder about what could be the source of its stability. So um, Dirac, Fowler, and others in 19, around 1926, they came up with the theory that from the newly found Fermi Dirac statistics at that time, and they found an explanation from Fermi Dirac statistics that it is basically the degeneracy pressure of the electrons that is supporting the star against gravitational flux. Because now there is no nuclear fuel to give it any pressure support. So basically, the electrons are repelling each other, and that is what is giving the star its stability. And not only that, after that, Chandrasekhar calculated the maximum possible mass of these white dwarfs, and this is now called the Chandrasekhar limit. And also, not only that, he also um, was, uh, speculated what would happen if masses were excess of this Chandrasekhar limit. And he proposed the idea that black holes could be formed if uh, the mass was heavier than the Chandrasekhar limit. And probably some of you have heard of the story that he faced severe criticism from his supervisor, Arthur Eddington. But now we already know the, the end of the story that uh, this was a very uh, successful model and Chandrasekhar was awarded Nobel Prize for, for this um, idea. Neutron star is even uh, stranger. The, the history is very interesting. So just after Chandrasekhar showed that massive stars can collapse, at that time, Chadwick discovered the neutron around 1932. And um, so at that time, around 1933, Bade and Zwicky came up with the concept that what would happen if we have just a star made up of neutron? And using general relativity, Oppenheimer and Polkov computed masses of these objects around 1939. Today, we call them as Tolbe and Oppenheimer Polkov equations. And but still, nobody knew about the existence of neutron star. It was just a theoretical idea. Until Jocelyn Bell, who was a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, she stumbled upon some strange giggles in the radio spectrum when she was trying to look for quasar. And she finally found that these objects, so radio pulses coming very, very periodically from Earth, an extragalactic source. And at that time, people didn't even know what it was. They thought it could be some aliens, or they, they were not sure where these periodic pulses are coming from. But then Bohr and Pacini came up with the lighthouse model, which says that it is basically the, the beam, electromagnetic beam from the neutron star that is sweeping us. Whenever, like a lighthouse, the beam passes our field of view. And these produces these very, very periodic pulses. I mean, these are neutron stars are among the most accurate clocks in the universe. So from that, we know finally now that pulsars are basically rapidly rotating neutron stars. And of course, the rest is history. Now we know a lot about neutron stars. But again, to motivate, uh, let me tell you an interesting fact that if you, I mean, the neutron stars are telling us, are giving us complementary information to what we can actually do with terrestrial experiments or any kind of theory. To understand this, you can look at this diagram, which is also called the QCD phase diagram. Quantum, uh, the quantum chromodynamics is a theory of strong interaction. And in this figure, you can see this is basically x-axis is density, and this is temperature. So basically, all the experiments, nuclear experiments, they are around one time saturation density. So this is an axis which is giving you the density in terms of nuclear densities. So around nuclear densities, we have information from nuclear calculations and nuclear <laughs> experimental data. Uh, heavy ion collision experiments, these particle accelerator experiments, they will give us information of hot and dense matter. So around two to three times the nuclear density and finite temperature. But neutron stars, on the other hand, they give us information here at higher density, like I told you, 2 to 10 times nuclear density, and of cold matter. So although we can have some information from nuclear experiments, we, we need to extrapolate them to regions where these are unknown. So this is where theoretical modeling comes in. So um, the neutron star interior, as we speculate today, is extremely complex, which is which makes it very interesting actually. And the reason is that we are going 
several orders of magnitude in density as we are going from the surface to the interior. So at the surface, we know that it should be formed of iron nuclei, more or less that is the core that was left behind at the end of uh, supernova explosion. But then as we go towards the interior, these nuclei start to become more and more deformed and also more and more neutron rich, something which we don't get in nuclear experiments. So these are more and more neutron rich. And as you can see, they start to get even deformed into some peculiar structures. Finally, these are called pasta phases because they look like spaghetti and meatballs and so on. So they are called pasta phases. And if you increase density even further, they ultimately melt into a liquid, mostly made of neutrons. That's why we call them a neutron star. So this is more or less what the outer core is made of. So all these nuclei form the outer crust and the inner crust. And then this outer core is mostly made up of neutrons. A small fraction of protons and electrons for charge neutrality and chemical equilibrium. But that is, I mean, the, the crust is quite thin. And basically, it is a fluid made up of neutrons. That's why we call them neutron stars. But the most interesting part, I mean, this is what fascinates me, is the inner core. Because we know absolutely nothing about the inner core. This is where we run out of information from nuclear experiments or heavy ion experiments. One idea we know from these kind of experiments, so in particle accelerator, like these uh, heavy ion, these particle accelerators, what happens is these, uh, when these beams collide against each other, a lot of particles are produced. And we know now that some strange particles are produced. They are actually called strange because of strangeness. So if you have had a course of fundamental physics, particle physics, you might know that there are most, all the things around us are made up of up and down quarks. But there are also heavier quarks. Why don't we see them? Because they, they also because they are very heavy. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't get these kinds of particles produced by us. But the high densities of neutron stars allows them to be produced in the core. So that means if we want to find the existence of strangeness, strange quarks, then we have to look in the inner core of neutron stars. But then we cannot prove directly. We don't have a telescope looking directly into the inner core. So that means that we need to find some kind of signature of these particles in whatever we are observing. And that is where the challenge comes. So um, what we typically do is Say we have a particular core composition, whether or not there are. So we can have many kinds of strange matter also. There is something called hyperons. Hyperons are basically baryons, like neutron proton, but replace one up or down for straight core. So that is a hyperon. Then you can have meson condensates. So these are like, uh, what is the equivalent? So something like so kaons and pions. So these are, these contain, uh, so, Pions have up and down quark, and imagine you replace one of them by strange. So that would make it a meson condensate. So this so, means, so they were the, I mean, uh, this this let's say this hyperon. So right. you are saying that they are formed in the core of the new Yeah, they can be. And the and, and, and the condition. I mean, yeah. you can also put them probably you can also have them in your particle collider. Right. Right. Yeah. So the main condition is the density thing. Yes. Or is it also something else? No, it is the density. And the reason is that because in particle accelerators, they are produced for a very short lifetime. Short time. And then they uh, they are uh, annihilated. Yeah. But what happens here is because of these high densities, this uh, makes them stable components of matter. Yes. So beyond, so for example, neutrons. Protons, these are fermions. And when they have very high energy, then at a certain point, they cross the threshold of formation of these particles. Mm -hmm. And then they start to populate them. And they are stable components of these objects. Okay, so this doesn't have any stable hyperons. Stable hyperons. Hyper 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 it could get in Right. Um, Another thing is, for example, particle accelerators, we speculate, but we have never seen the existence of free quarks because we never go to those densities. Mm -hmm. But here, it's very fascinating to think that you can actually have quarks. There can be a, a phase transition from hadronic matter to quark matter. And then this would be the only place in the universe where we can actually see quarks. Okay, So that is what makes it very interesting. So what we do in theoretical modeling is we have to construct some kind of a model 
basically this is done with the help of an equation of state. So equation of state is something you know for also for say gas or something like this you have in thermodynamics you have encountered equation of state. So it is the relationship between pressure, density, temperature. So in general here temperature is almost zero. These are very cold objects. So basically pressure as a function of density is the equation of state. So I can De encode my information of the composition in my equation of state. So my equation of state tells me what is my interior composition. Then I can, using that equation of state, I can solve, for example, some uh, thermodynamic, so hydrostatic equilibrium condition, which gives me the structure. So if something I can observe, like its mass or radius, and then I can compare with observations and see what which model is correct. Okay. So for example, just to give you an idea, so say I have here my equation of state, so pressure as a function of density. This contains my interior information. And now I can translate this to its mass radius relation. It's like a one-to-one -one mapping. And then I go and observe and see which is actually correct, whether or not it can um, whether or not it can explain the observation that we are seeing here. So um, um yeah, and just to give you a brief idea, there are different ways of testing nuclear physics with um, these kind of models. So the idea is that we don't know how particles behave when in such dense matter. So there are different kinds of models. So for example, microscopic models where people start by taking nuclear nuclear interaction and then see how it behaves at high density. Or another easier way is taking a phenomenological model, which means you have some parameters and then you predict how it would behave at nuclear saturation density, you go and check with the actual experimental data, and then you can fit your parameters. So these are the two main ways in which one creates theoretical models. So now we can, once we have a model, we can go and check for ourselves and see what observations tell us. Luckily, neutron stars are observable throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So we heard about Jocelyn Bell's discovery in radio, but now today we have vast number of space-based and ground-based telescopes with which we can uh, scan the sky at all multiple wavelengths and we can actually infer a lot of different information about neutron stars. For example, if we observe its periodic pulses, we know exactly its spin period. We can measure its mass from, I will, I will tell you about this in the next slide. So from binary objects, we can calculate its mass. We can um, calculate its temperature from its thermal spectrum. We can, if we have some spectral lines, we can calculate its compactness, which is a, a ratio of mass to radius. So we can calculate a large number of observables from these uh, observations. Now, neutron stars are highly relativistic, right? So these are one of the most relativistic objects, which means that in addition to normal Keplerian properties that we know for stars, they also, we can even measure its next order post Keplerian parameters. So that gives us information about its binary uh, behavior. So from that, we can calculate its masses very accurately. So here, I think the resolution is not very good, but typically neutron stars until very recently, most of the masses were around 1.4. So people thought, okay, most, mostly this is the canonical neutron star mass. The surprise came about 10 years back when we started to discover these very heavy neutron stars, around two solar mass neutron stars. So um, radius measurement is more challenging because this is for isolated objects. And also we need to, a lot of, there is a lot of model dependence. So there is a thermal spectrum so that one can uh, fit models to thermonuclear X-ray bursts or burst oscillations and so on. So until recently, there was a lot of uncertainty in radius measurements. But a recent breakthrough happened with this NASA's mission called NICER. So, so, sorry, the, just yeah. again, uh, so for the mass measurements, yeah. the results you showed, yeah. yeah. So these are all uh, measured via what, which technique? Because some, of course, will be, gra few will be gravitational waves. I will come to gravitational okay. waves. But, yeah. but these yeah. are the yeah. These are the These are the binary objects you are looking at. Right. Just by Yeah, so um, recently with the launch of the NICER mission, Neutron Star Interior Composition mission from NASA, uh, we have started to very accurately measure the radius. Also. So, um, so just to give you an idea, so 
Here you can see a large number of theoretical models and we don't know which ones of these are correct. And correspondingly, we can also plot its different mass radius relation. But we need to see which of these models are correct and which ones aren't. So now, if I superimpose these mass measurements, here you can see that this 1.4 solar mass, many of these models can satisfy because any line which is above this line can explain this model. But the two solar mass, you can see that some models cannot satisfy. So that's why we are interested in measuring more and more uh, stiff, uh, so more and more, um, so higher and higher maximum masses. So we can put a limit to the different uh, model, equation of state models. With the nicer, this has become even better because now we have better radius measurements also. So you can see here these uncertainty ellipses that are from this recent nicer measurement. That means only those lines which are within these ellipses will be valid. The others are, the other ones can be ruled out. So now comes the story of gravitational waves. So here you can see that already here, so there were so many different models and as I told you, there are also many different equations of state that can satisfy this. How can we break the degeneracy? How can we say exactly this one is a better model or not? So neutron stars, so neutron stars are highly relativistic, like I said. So these are extremely compact. So what Einstein predicted 100 years back, 1915, was that since these are highly relativistic, neutron stars, uh, in any perturbation in neutron star, non-axisymmetric perturbation should produce gravitational waves. And gravitational waves will be able to give us a measurement of its interior properties. Okay, we have a way to probe directly the interior. So um, to give you an idea, so there can be many ways in which gravitational waves can be produced from neutron star. For example, so this is showing these different um, polarizations of gravitational waves. So basically any non-axis symmetric perturbation can produce gravitational waves. So say there are some glitches in uh, neutron star rotation. So any sudden glitch can produce a neutron star gravitational wave. If there are flares, so strongly magnetic uh, neutron stars like, sun, like the sun can be flares. So these flares, all these can be some burst sources of gravitational waves. Uh, okay. where, where do these glitches come from? I mean, what is the origin of this? Yeah, this is also very interesting. So there are again different models. Earlier, people used to think that maybe it is the crust which is cracking and that's why there are glitches. But then people understood later that crust, there is a limit to the crust elasticity. And crust cracking cannot produce such large glitches in the rotation period. So now the more popular model is superfluidity. This is also very interesting. So people think that the interior, the core, inner core is superfluid and the outer, uh, so the crust. So if you if you go to a laboratory and you put a fluid, superfluid in motion, in rotation, these will form vortices. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so vortices, so we think the exact same thing happens. So for example, so if there is um, uh, like vortices in the star and it is rotating, it is thought that these vortices or flux tubes pin themselves to the crust. It, the same thing happens in the laboratory. And now after rotation, after a certain uh, angular momentum is accumulated, it snaps. And there is exchange of angular momentum and it goes back to angular. So that's why there is this periodic kind of uh, glitch and then relaxation phase. So this is the more popular model. Now. Right. So and also there can be some continuous sources of gravitational waves. So what is it? So for example, if there is a bump on the surface of a neutron star and it is rotating, these are typically called mountains. So a mountain can also produce continuous gravitational waves. Although a mountain on neutron star surface is few centimeters high. So if you want to be a mountaineer, you can go to the neutrons. <laughs> but then getting <laughs> up for a while, up very difficult to be so um, also very strongly magnetized neutron star, they can be very elongated, like very deformed, not spherical anymore. And anything which is shaped like this and rotating can also produce gravitation. So these are some examples of how neutron stars can produce gravitation. Now, what I am very particularly interested in is this oscillation. So we know from, for example, fluid uh, experiments and even this is seen in astro seismology so the any star 
shows these kind of oscillations. Even the sun, so heliosismology is also known. This is basically seismology means earthquakes, right? So it is like quakes on the surface of a star, also on the Newton star. And depending on which force brings it back to equilibrium, there are different kinds of modes. So F mode is like pressure, but fundamental mode, uh, pressure mode, G modes are because of difference in buoyancy, R modes are because of rotation, W modes are pure space-time modes, and so on. So these are some kind of, you can imagine, some perturbation oscillation going on in the star. And since this is, an again, a rotating, oscillating star, it produces gravitational waves. And interestingly, if we can measure the frequency or damping time of this oscillation, it encodes all the information about its interior composition. So it's a very good way of finding the interior composition of stars. So the hunt for gravitational waves, so like I told you, so back in 1915, Einstein had proposed that neutron stars are gravitational wave sources. So people have been hunting for gravitational waves since then. Of course, we have come a long way in 100 years. Technology has improved by far. And um, again, um, I, when I was doing my PhD at that time, I had many student friends who were working on LIGO Virgo project. And can you imagine the, the frustration when after years and years of working hard, they did not observe the project. And in a lot of countries, even there was a cut in the funding because they said you will never detect revolutions. The sensitivity, the reason why it took us 100 years is this. So this is the characteristic strain of, of gravitational waves. So I don't know if you can see, but this is 10 to the power. Minus, 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 20, minus 26, minus 24, and so on. And these are the typical frequencies. So imagine if you want to detect something, you have to kind of observe a hair on the surface of the moon. And it took us a hundred years to be able to, I mean, it's not a, a, a single step, okay? So from generation one to generation two, everything, I will tell you a little bit about the challenges also. So experimentally, theoretically, data analysis, everything improved drastically over the past decades until, uh, so here you can see actually a little bit like this movie where you can see how it, um, this actually works. So basically, these are all L-shaped detectors, four kilometer, four kilometer long. And this is, you know about interferometry. So these are interferometers, but instead of light, now if a gravitational wave passes through them, so this is what uh, happens. So, so, you know, so here, um, so this is way more challenging now because even on the surface of the earth, there is a curvature. So you can imagine how you will have to reflect back this beam and so on. So these are technologically very challenging. But the idea is this, the same. So um, again, there was a big motivation for looking for this kind of gravitation waves. Already back in 1974, these two gentlemen, Joseph Taylor and Russell Hulls, they found a binary system of neutron stars. And what they found was that for this system, they are slowing down, and as they are slowing down, they are emitting gravitational waves. So they are losing energy, coming closer and closer together. And they found that this exactly followed the general relativistic prediction of Einstein. So they received the 1993 Nobel Prize for this discovery. So basically, this was the first indirect detection of gravitational waves. So of course, this motivated people more, and they were looking for um, this uh, the gravitational waves. And finally, so after 10 years of searching, uh, gravitational waves, uh, probably some of you, maybe you don't, but you know that 2016, 2015 or 2016 came the first gravitational wave direct detection, okay, 100 years after Einstein's prediction. And this came from two black holes. Of course, black holes are much more massive, so, so gravitational waves from them are more, I mean, they are, they are more intense. So I don't know if you can hear the sound. Let me try. Right. Oh, probably I have muted. <laughs> no problem. So there is a chirp, chirp sound. So that is the typical signal uh, of a merger. And that is what was found in both the LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston detectors. And for this discovery, 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics went to these three gentlemen, uh, Rainer Weiss, Kip Thorne, and Barry Barish, who were behind the LIGO project. And so now again, that this discovery came, people were looking for more and more sources of gravitational waves. And the first 
um, the first uh, gravitational wave discovery was a miracle. I mean, we were not expecting this and it came with a huge, like a miracle because this uh, gravitational wave, so this merger of two neutron stars in, on 17th August 2017, that's why it's called 170817. This merger was not only detected in gravitational waves, it was detected in all these other uh, telescopes that were operational at that time. So for me, an integral observed the same object in gamma rays. And from that, we know now that short gamma ray bursts, short GRBs, are associated with mergers of neutron star. So these were speculated since a long time, but this was one incident where this was verified. Then um, there were many other discoveries also. So for example, the these are VLA Chandra, but also the uh, the optical. We know that it was a kilonova. So the kilonova is exactly associated with a gamma ray burst. This was also confirmed here. And funnily, there was also I won't have it here, but there was also discovery of spectral lines from this, um, from X-ray spectral line from this event. And what was understood from that is that these heavy elements like gold, silver, platinum, these are all pro produced through a process called R process nucleosynthesis. And now we know today that this happens in neutron star mergers. So imagine that all the gold, silver, platinum you are wearing now, this was produced in a distant neutron star motor. So you can imagine how fascinating that is. Okay, so basically what I want to emphasize here is that this was uh, a, an unusual discovery. And this led to a completely new field of collaboration between gravitational wave astronomy and normal electromagnetic, which is today called multi-messenger astronomy. So we know that today working together, this gives us much more information than working alone. So um, this is what a typical neutron star merger waveform looks like. So basically when they are merging, so this is the spiral phase. Then at the merger, so you can see here that there is a, a broadening of this waveform. And then there is a ring down in the post-merger phase. Okay, so this is a simulation. And this is showing you the typical merger waveform. Um, so what was interesting is that in this in spiral phase, the neutron stars tidally deform each other, like the Earth, Sun, Moon, or, you know, do to each other. And that tidal deformability is actually related to its compactness or to its radius. So this was a, a strange discovery which led us to put very important constraints on neutron star radii. Like I was telling you, radii are much more difficult to measure. So now gravitational waves are giving us a new uh, way of uh, checking the water radius. So again, this was the first discovery. And of course, it was uh, the most uh, surprising discovery. After that, we found many other uh, neutron stars. So actually here, these yellow ones are the electromagnetic neutron stars, which means from multivalent observations. These orange ones are from gravitational waves. So this is at the end point of the third observing run catalog. And um, um, these are also ANSB mergers, right? Not only VNS mergers. Yeah, also there are only a couple of NSBH mergers. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them VNS mergers. There are more than two. So actually I, I didn't show here. I can show you. So there in the catalog, there are more. Uh, okay, okay. I mean, you are like, okay. Yeah. So at the end of the, so th we are at the end of the third observing run. We have started the fourth observing run. I mean, like, you are not only considering confident events, you are also considering. Yes, yeah, some of them, because some of them have yeah, very yes. large masses. Yeah, so this is also something that you said, I will mention here. So earlier people thought, you can see here from the electromagnetic spectrum, that here uh, we thought that neutron stars cannot be very much more massive than two solar mass. And black holes cannot be lighter than five, three solar mass. So we thought that there is some kind of a mass gap between these two. What happened now, you can see here with gravitational waves, we started to see objects in the middle of the mass gap. 
So now it has raised more questions than we had before the observations, which means now we have to reanalyze our uh, formation channels, whether we actually understand how black holes are formed, how neutron stars are formed. So, so for some objects like you are seeing, we don't know if these are very massive neutron stars or these are um, very light black holes. I'll also give you some other options soon. So there can be many other possibilities. So again, you can see it's opening up many new exciting possibilities. So just to give you an idea also for black holes, all these uh, orange ones are, sorry, the red ones are electromagnetic black holes. Mm -hmm. So we, earlier we found electromagnetic means like we found the accretion disk yes. around black holes and so on. Mm -hmm. So there we thought these are between 3 to 20 solar mass. With LIGO Virgo black holes, you can see they are all the way from about 2 to 200. So now we have to explain how these 200 solar mass neutron stars are formed. So we had earlier, there are, I mean, there are many questions that have been raised now because we did not consider these kind of supermassive like this. Do we detect 200 solar mass neutron stars? These are black holes. These are black holes. These are black holes. Those ones are neutron stars, the orange yeah. ones. So, these are these are the neutron stars. So by electromagnetic in this, what 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 is meant exactly that they for the were, for the neutron star for both neutron so, stars or black holes electromagnetic multi wave. So for black you mean observations yeah, or black 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 to look at the X ray yeah. accretion disk right yes yes so that black holes and red ones okay but for these you got the, it was detected in LIGO so there were some I mean what does these so here, the, what are the red, red points? So the red ones are the ones which we observed earlier before detection of gravitational waves. Okay, so we haven't observed gravitational waves from them, but they are there. That's yes, okay. yes, okay. yes. So this is just for comparison. And here, these are all the much wider range of masses we can see. No, I suddenly thought maybe for some cases we already knew the black hole. And the so actually, there are three different kinds of searches for gravitational waves. One is called a direct search. So where we know that it exists and we are looking for it. Another one is called a narrow band. So which means that we know, but we haven't seen it yet. But we know more or less, for example, the supernova explosion or supernova remnant. But we haven't seen the neutron star. We know, okay, we can look here. And then another one is just, you know, red light search. Red light light search. Light. So again, some of these have been observed. We knew they were there and we found gravitation with. But some of them, I mean, this is just a comparison of the scales. But the gravitational waves are from only from mergers, not yeah, from so any other thing. No, no. So no. until now, we have found, so I, I before we go back to this slide. So remember, I said that, so they can come from both uh, binary and isolation. So far, we have only observed from binary. And the reason is that these are much more intense. But what I'm telling you now is this other possibilities also. These are isolated ones. Okay. So these we haven't detected, although hopefully we will detect. For example, continuous wave sources. These are very interesting because these are long-term sources. Binaries is for a few seconds, right? Whereas this will be there for years. So until now, we haven't reached the sensitivity to find them. Hopefully in the coming observing runs, we'll be able to detect these. But so, they will not be in the same frequency range as well. Yes, exactly. So that's that's the other point. So uh, where was this frequency? Oh, sorry, I don't know Yeah, here. Yeah, so these are okay. This is not very visible, but so this is the same frequency band, but more or less. Okay, maybe I will show you in another picture later. So we are for even for mergers actually. Yeah, even for this one, we have only observed the in spiral phase. But we cannot detect this because this is just going out of the light band. So now even there are some proposals like Australia has proposed the NEMO mission. So this is sensitive, sensitive to this frequency band. So again, we are missing out a lot of information. But again, from proof of principle, hopefully we will be able to you know, expand our sensitivity range. But uh, again, yeah, we can observe these from isolated as well, I mean, in principle. And so in this figure, are you saying that, let's say there are 20 or so uh, black hole binaries 
and black hole normal star binary in our galaxy that have been detected in electromagnetically. <laughs> Are you saying that those have been targeted for GW observation and in some cases some GW have been uh, detected or I thought that there hasn't anything no, been detected like you no know, most of these are binary. This is true. These so are mostly GW binary. Is, if I understand correctly yeah. or pardon me if I'm wrong. I think all of the GW detections are from most of the right now here. Okay. So yeah, so again, now that we have detected, we know it is there. So of course, we are planning to uh, go to better and better sensitivity. So right now, we are starting the O4 run. O4 run is going on. So uh, the catalog I just showed you was until the O3. So now, as you can see here, so this is the LIGO Virgo uh, bands. And these two have been detecting until now. So the LIGO bands, so as you can see here, with every run, the sensitivity is getting better and better. Okay, so the curves are going deeper and deeper in the, in the curve. Kagra has recently joined uh, operations, but again, Kagra, unfortunately, the sensitivity has not reached its desired sensitivity. So, uh, also, in fact, Virgo will join before, uh, but at a lower sensitivity. This is again a little bit of a concern, but hopefully, we will be able to, you know, troubleshoot the problems and and in, uh, increase the sensitivity. So Virgo is actually a, a European uh, detector. It is slightly smaller, but uh, so sensitivity, it had played a big role until now, but again, O4 we have to see. O5 is very interesting because O5 is where LIGO India will join the game. So LIGO India, as you can see, these are the currently operational gravitational wave detectors. Two are in the US, LIGO Hanford and LIGO Houston. GEO is very small, it's about 2.5 kilometers, so it's not, it is used mostly for testing some technologies. Uh, Virgo and Kagra are already operational. And what happens is if LIGO India joins this global array of detectors, the entire collaboration will benefit from it. This is why there was this global support for LIGO India. And the reason is twofold. So one is, of course, because we are entering the game at a very advanced stage. So we will join. We will try to achieve the sensitivity that we require for O5, which means the technologies that are required for this project will be developed in India. Second is that LIGO, it's like having these two eyes, you know. We need to, in order to accurately locate a source, we need triangulation. So until now, the LIGO detectors, you can see they have been the best candidates so far, and but they are not very widely separated. But now if we have the third detector, LIGO detector in India, so we will be, so here you can see this banana shaped object. So this is the current localization that we can, so for example, you have gravitational wave coming from a particular uh, direction of the sky. So you can say, okay, within this uncertainty band, the somewhere the, look, the source is lying. But if you have LIGO India, you can see it will be reduced to this small units. So that is how much better the, the local, sky localization will become when LIGO India joins. So this is why there was this big support for, for this kind of project. Uh, so um, I think I'm almost, I'm sorry, I think I'm okay with time. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, again, like I said, so proof of principle, we already know this is working great. So there is a global consensus for building bigger and better detail. So these are called 3G detectors. So currently, we are at the second generation of detectors. LIGO India is somewhat 2.5 because it, it is like it is going to join at a better sensitivity. 3G detectors will come up in about 10, 15 years. Okay, but these will be so currently the design uh, process is going on. All these uh, cons uh, consortiums are coming up. So consortia are coming up. So basically, there will be uh, many detectors. For example, Einstein telescope will come up in Europe. Uh, Cosmic Explorer will come up in the US. People are talking about 20 kilometer, 40 kilometer. Um, so you can imagine, imagine putting a 20 kilometer uh, detector where the laser beam has to go through it. So it cannot be curved. So you have to uh, correct for the curvature of the earth for 20 kilometers. You can imagine the kind of technical uh, uh, like, uh, you know, challenges associated with this. So anyway, so these are the current proposals. So what we will achieve with this is that, so we are here now, O3. So with A+, plus, so A+, plus is this O4, O5, so the next 
um, upcoming runs of LIGO Virgo. So A plus, we will observe a wider sphere of uh, objects in the sky. And CE and ET, so these two, will observe a much larger volume of, of uh, sources. So the more and more sources we observe, of course, we will, we will uh, detect better and better, and hopefully also neutron star merger. And similarly also, advantage is that we are also getting better in sensitivity. So the last run, all these detections I showed you was here, O3. So um, LIGO A+, plus, so this is what we are aiming at right now. Then uh, Cosmic Explorer and Ice and Telescope are here, so much better sensitivity. There is this Australian mission called NEMO, which is produced. So basically what it will do is it will, it is more sensitive to this post-merger. And post-merger is actually where equation of state will play a big role. Because after the merger, the stability of this post-merger object depends totally on its internal combination. So this has not been funded yet. Voyager, so there is another uh, space-based, so there is a proposal for a space-based gravitational wave mission called Voyager as well. So again, like I said, so it's very exciting field now and it has just started to pick up. So there will be many more gravitational wave detectors. And not only that, so, so far I have been talking about terrestrial interferometers because these are most sensitive to neutron stars and supernovae, like I said. But again, if you're interested, you can look into this much wider landscape of gravitational waves, there's much more happening. If you <coughs> sorry, if you saw in the newspaper recently, pulsar timing arrays also found the very low frequency gravitational waves. So uh, Indian pulsar timing array was also part of it. So they found uh, gravitational waves coming from Big Bang and supermassive black hole in spiral, so from early universe and so on. These are, again, they found evidence. It was not a confirmed observation. They found evidence for these very low frequency gravitational waves. Then there will be some space-based interferometers. LISA is one of them. LISA is a, a proposed mission with, so you can't see from this picture, but it's like an equilateral triangle floating in space. So that will also observe these um, um, extreme mass ratio in spirals and so on. So you can see that there are there is this huge spectrum of gravitational wave sources, and we are now aiming to detect all of it with many space-based and ground-based uh, telescopes. Um, finally, a little bit of flavor of what I do in my research group, so to give you an idea. So I work on theoretical physics, so modeling, like I said. So recently we had some very interesting um, uh, perspectives taking into account gravitational wave measurement. For example, uh, in my group and some other works as well, uh, what was done was combining information from nuclear experiments, astrophysical data, so multi-messenger gravitational wave and astrophysical data, and also heavy ion collision, combining all of this to put a constraint on the uh, neutron star equation of state. Then another thing um, that I'm very happy also, yeah. So when you were estimating neutron star equation of state from gravitational waves, mm -hmm. what mass model are you assuming? Are you assuming any mass model? I mean, uh, so I think what you are talking about is um, analysis of the mass measurement itself from gravitational waves. The equation of state measurement can be biased by the mass. This is also true. Yeah. yeah. So you need to either you need to feed mass and equation of state. I mean mass means I am talking talking about the population hyperbola. Right. Not the mass chart. So mass. what here I am talking about, these are actually these are this is not related directly to LIGO data. These are uh, investigations you can see. So what for example here what I'm showing is we take an equation of state model. I calculate what uh, would be the imprints of interior composition on the frequencies of the different modes or the damping times. And then we predict, okay, so where can we look for this information? And these the, the masses that are determined are from the equation of state itself. So this, again, this we so this one, what I'm showing you is not directly compared to any gravitational wave data. This is a prediction okay. for what would be the sickness. Uh, again, if you want to do it the other way around, then you have to take the mass bias also into account. Yeah. Yeah. So another example. So this is also very interesting. That depending on what is the interior composition, it can have an effect on the tidal heating during the inspiral. 
earlier people thought, okay, neutron stars are made of only neutrons. That is what is usually assumed in the LIGO collaboration when they do the data analysis. But we recently showed that if you have these strange components, then it will affect the tidal heating and we can actually find its imprint in the signal. Okay, so these are like kind of ways in which one can look for the interior signature. Another interesting thing is that if, uh, so again, we know that dark matter is abundant in the universe. And we also think that if dark matter is there, it could be captured inside a neutron star as a dark matter core, or, or it could even form a dark matter hill around it. And now what is interesting is it will, again, depending on which is the case, it will affect this mass radius and so on. So it could be that there's objects, there is a speculation that it's, sorry, if the, these mass gap objects could be something which have a dark matter signature. So again, in that case, from observation of gravitational wave, we can put a constraint on the dark matter model. So again, these are many different ways of probing uh, neutron stars or dark matter uh, with the help of gravitational waves. Uh, another thing that we also look at is whether or not there is a phase transition from hadronic matter to quark matter and how it will be. If it is a sharp phase transition, it will have a different kind of signature than a smooth phase transition. So depending on the phase transition, whether or not it's a sharp one or a smooth one, there will be a difference in the gravitational wave spectrum. So we are trying to look for these different uh, um, signatures of internal composition on gravitational wave. Uh, another study we did was that if, again, this is related to the data. So basically, if we have <clears throat> with the better and better sensitivity of detectors or with the third generation detectors, whether or not we can constrain the nuclear parameters from them. So we, we showed that it will be better and better constrained with the um, more and more gravitational wave observation. So, um, yeah, also, I mean, until now I talked about a few things, but there are many other possibilities of looking for the signature of internal composition. For example, like I said, stability of the post-merger element, whether or not it will be a hypermassive neutron star, whether it will collapse to a black hole. So it depends on the how compressible the matter is. Also, cooling of neutron star, we can observe its temperature as a function of age. And depending on what kind of matter you have inside, you can have a different kind of cooling. So that also gives you right information. Also, the supernova remnant and growth of neutron star, this also depends heavily on its interior composition. So there are many ways. I mean, this is not just one way. But what we are emphasizing is that, again, there will be, with multi-messenger astronomy, there are many ways of looking for this internal composition. Finally, uh, just a few words on LIGO India project itself. So uh, already we have, we have just got into uh, May 12, 2023. We obtained after a long wait, finally, the approval for this project. And it is coming up in uh, Hingoli in Eastern Maharashtra. And this is what it's supposed to look like. <clears throat> Basically, so this project has four main institutes. Ayuka is one of them and there are also many other institutions all across the country which are currently members of LIGO India Scientific Collaboration which means not only LIGO India project but they are related to the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. They are already contributing to gravitational wave science and um, again so I only talk about the theoretical so where is it so the theoretical physics perspective so which is my field but as you can see here so this requires, so this project requires uh, like expertise from many, many fields. So quantum gravity, general relativity, precision tests and fundamental tests, for example, quantum metrology, laser physics. So these are all related to building the detector. So currently that the detector is being built, there are, there are challenges in laser physics, vacuum technology, optical sensor control system and so on. Then uh, computing astronomy data center, machine learning, and so on. So these are all challenges of uh, gravitational wave science. Then uh, again, multi-messenger astronomy, which means gravitational wave requires multi-messenger uh, partners. So X-ray, radio astronomy, gamma ray, you know. So this is something that is affecting everyone and possibilities are increasing in every field. Again, to give you some examples, so these are, you can see these huge LIGO mirrors, uh, the laser technology that is used, the suspensions, 
the vacuum technology, the control systems, and so on. So all of these fields require um, uh, support. Um, so just to give you an idea, so LIGO India is also, so being a chair of outreach, I want to talk about outreach of this project. So uh, LIGO India uh, organizes or participates in tech fest and science festivals. So if you are organizing something here or in Calcutta, please let us know so that we can represent gravitational wave science. You are also most welcome to participate in that. So as you can see here, I served Bhopal, IIT Tirupati, etc. So last year we were we represented and we also organized a lot of workshops, data science workshops, and so on. So lectures on gravitational wave science. So these are organized in uh, different parts of the country. We also have a participate in National Science Day at IUCA, and also we partnered with our partner institutes to celebrate this all over the country. And you can also look at the LIGO India website and also the different social media channels because online also all through the pandemic, we had uh, many um, interesting um, online activities. For example, there is an entire series called GW at Home Lecture Series. And these cover all the different ranges of topics in gravitational wave science. You can go home and look at these playlists. They are all there on YouTube channel. Uh, many talks by, for example, Rhino Weiss and others. So, Kip Thorne, they have given uh, gravitational wave science talks that you can do that. Um, there, there are many online workshops. So, we organized, for example, this was a builder detector workshops where students um, build, designed a detector, and there were also prizes for this. Um, there were also uh, a webinar series on astrophotography. If you are interested to learn, you can go and have a look at this playlist. There are talks by very well-known uh, astrophysicists of India. Also, we recently, last week, we also had an astrophoto calendar that you can download. Um, so these are many things you can find on social media. Finally, opportunities. So there are also many opportunities for undergraduate postgraduate students to do projects, uh, particularly the experimental ones. And these are held at the different Lago India institutes. You can have a look at the uh, GW at IUCA the research opportunities. And uh, so many of them offer master detect thesis projects. Currently, there is an open call for international LIGO SURF program. So this is a Caltech Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship program. You can apply for this as well. Although the pre-selected students sent from India will be mostly on experimental physics. But you can also look at the international website because if you want to apply for theoretical physics, there may be some opportunity. So there are, of course, many other uh, workshops, for example, Finesse workshop, hackathon, etc. So keep an eye out if you want to know more about these kind of activities. Finally, there are uh, there is a LIGO India blog called Gravity Matters. So you can go to the LIGO India website or any of the social media for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, you know. Uh, so you will find many different categories. For example, there is a glorious women category which talks about women working in gravitational wave science. There is a podcast series called Listening to the Cosmos. There is LI Science, which is uh, very pedagogical articles about gravitational wave science. Um, then there are webinar series. There is there are interviews of students working in this field, what their, are, what their experiences are called behind the scenes. There are even uh, gravitational wave sci art. So even you can participate in any of these. If you are interested, you can uh, reach out to me or you can write to LIGO India. Um, so basically, you can, if you are interested to uh, participate in some kind of art form associated with gravitational wave science, so feel free to, feel free to reach out to us. So again, um, I will stop here. Thank you. Questions? Okay, we'll start from the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Devarati, uh, so let's nice talk. Um, so let's let's talk about constraining the. Can we go to the slides where yes. we are going through the neutral star equation of things? Yes, maybe I can go. Because any of these? Yeah, yeah. Or... Any. I mean, for, because you said that this. Neutral star Equation of state it will also have impact on the. So my question is that uh, where are these? How 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 are these different uh, equations of states? Like for example, uh, 
This one will be QCD, sorry, is it? Yeah. So, 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 so if you can give an example, like, yeah. I mean, generally, yeah. So, for example, just uh, to show here. So, for, so, this is the information we currently have. So, about nuclear physics. So, close to nuclear saturation density. Mm -hmm. So, now when we extrapolate this information, so we have several uncertainties. One of the uncertainties, the nuclear interaction at high levels. This is something we don't know. Second thing is that nuclear experiment or Hitian experiment, these are, they have equal number of neutron systems. And when we're talking about neutron stars, they have many more neutrons than protons. This is something called isospin asymmetry. So that is also something that has to be corrected for. We don't know what happens in that case. So that's why in the theoretical model, there are these uncertainties have to be modeled. And that is what gives rise to, so I was showing you this, um, this. So this is basically the nuclear interaction at higher density and higher associated spin asymmetry, which is modeled in these groups. They can be fitted only close to the saturation density or at higher temperature. From, from nuclear physics. From nuclear physics. So then you extrapolate it. Yeah. Try to so see. that is what is giving the uncertainty. So basically all these equation of state models. So they, they have... They, we only have information at very low density. But once we go beyond that, they are all correct, basically, because we don't know how the behavior will be at high density. Okay, so then, then, my quest, then I think the question is that, so we, give, we get a bunch of, uh, you know, models. I mean, I can see lots of lines there, so there must be a large number of models. Right. And then from there, you can translate it to the mass radius. Right. Like and you show in the, the bottom plot that some right. of them are, right. uh, you know, ruled out. But that, those are, so those come from the equations of state, right? Yeah, so basically you uh, solve equations of hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, so gravity balancing the, and then you can translate pressure density to mass radius. So each of these lines, Responding to okay. something. because what we are doing in these experiments, we are measuring mass and rate. Yes. Right. Then you then, then you translate your equation of state and say that which of these right. relations sort of explain these kinds of this kind of mass rate yes. relationship. But what are the pre-parameters? I mean, how so so my question is that can just by measuring the mass and radius input constraints on the equation of state, or there are other unknown parameters in the modeling that come. Did I make sense? Yes, yes, sense? yes. No, you are correct in saying that. So more or less, what happens is, um, so again, if I go back to this one, for so, example, yeah, so there are two main methods of modeling. So one is this microscopic model. So basically, people calculate nuclear nuclear forces then three nucleon, four nucleon forces. And this is very complicated. People took 10 years to go from here to here. And then what happens is that people, some, some of my colleagues who were working on microscopic model, they said the maximum neutron star mass we can have is 1.7. Then came the discovery of two solar mass. So all, they were, all of them were ruled out. So now, is was it all wrong? So, yeah. So they said, no, then what we are doing is we are neglecting the higher order. Of the so this is the thing. So now observations are helping to motivate what your theoretical models are. Okay. Phenomenological models are easier because they have parameters that can be adjusted. So again, problem is you can adjust them easily, but there's less predictive part. Yeah. So it's a, it's a both way thing that right. you actually benefit from your observation right. and also you, know, you have to predict something in order to test. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's why nowadays Bayesian studies are very popular because yeah, you because have, you have model in model, model. Yeah, yeah. Model dependencies. So, I have a related question. So, when you are measuring equation of state to mm -hmm. nicer, mm -hmm. I can guess, okay, so you are measuring mass and radius and you are putting that one to. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you are measuring equation of state to, let's say, gravitational emission, let's say, like, mm -hmm. or like, okay, like. So you need to assume some equation of state to get yeah. the hyperparameter, yeah. right? Yeah. Then like you have automatically that bias that you are assuming some equation of state and then you are fitting those hyperparameters. So there is, I haven't gone to the full story. So again, what is usually done is even from equations of state, one can construct some equation of state independent relation. These are called universal relations. Mm -hmm. So some, for example, uh, I versus Q. So and um, moment of inertia versus angular momentum. 
So these kind of, uh, you will see that no matter what your equation of state, these are universal more or less. And or, or we look for some relation which is unique. So then we can at least from, from the gravitational wave data, we can get this information. And then from that, we can try to infer what is the uh, equation of state or whether or not our equation of state satisfies this. This is, yeah. So when you're talking about this black, um, sorry, the, the dark matter halo and yes. things like that, there are two unknown stages, isn't it? One is the equation of state, yes. another is the uh, dark matter model itself. Yes. Yeah, so how can you... Uh, of course, no. What happened until now, so for example, just give an example, this mass gap measure. So until now we were saying, okay, it is either a black hole or an infrared. But now this third possibility you cannot rule out because the current uncertainty in dark matter bottles is large. And there are certain models which can also equally well satisfy this same observation of mass because gravitational waves are only, <laughs> uh, only sensitive to the mass. So that mass you can also have if you have a dark matter component. So you cannot rule that out unless you have some other observation. So now this is becoming also more and more interesting because all the people working on dark matter. Are, so what I work in my group is we try to see if dark matter is there, whether or not it affects oscillation. Rates. I mean, if you have two different observations, then maybe you can try to break the degeneracy. So we can, maybe it um, it shows the same mass, but at least from the oscillation mode, it does not show the same frequency. So it is trying to break the degeneracy. So, uh, what kind of uh, observation? Two different yeah, detector so or two? Yeah, so for example, uh, also oscillation. Yeah. yeah, so these oscillation modes, so also in my other slide, for example. <coughs> yeah, this. So here, for example, these are F modes. Uh, F modes are fundamental acoustic no, modes. So I understand there are modes. So yeah. What? two different observations you are talking about. Yeah, so from... this, we can measure the frequency or the damping time of these oscillations. So if there is an oscillation, so until now we haven't detected no, but in future, If we detect the uh, damping time or the frequency of these oscillation modes, then we can, depending on the kind of composition, if we have dark matter, it will be different. If it has hyperon, it will be different. So not with only mass, we may not be able to decouple. We may not be able to say whether or not it is dark matter and infrastructure or it's a black hole. But if we have additional information from uh, some oscillation mode, we can say, okay, this range is not possible for hyperon, so it must be this. So, so that, additional that will come from again from just uh, gravitational so wave signal. Yeah, from the gravitational wave. But there are two, two things that you are detecting, you are extracting from this. This is yeah. also GW observations. Or this is also GW, GW observations. Yeah. So why this is not available right now? Because we are sensitive to sensitive to that. Yeah. We can right now we only have information from the uh, tidal this one tidal deformability. So when they are in this in spiral, so you have to ring down which way you have yeah. to model it. You have to yeah. So right now there are only simulations, only simulations available for this part. So we try to speculate, okay, if there is higher strange matter, then it will collapse faster. If there is dark matter, what will... So dark matter, very recently, we have some simulation. Again, there are many more models than we have simulations. So these are all research in progress. So people try to see, okay, if there is dark matter, what will be the effect on the post -merger? Will it collapse faster to a black hole? And then when we have observation, we will be able to say, okay, whether or not it is dark matter, or it can probably constrain some dark matter models. So again, this is a very nascent field because dark matter, again, I mean, there are uh, experiments, there are observations from uh, cosmology and so on. So there are people are, again, this is also multi messenger because people are trying to uh, see which uh, parameters of which satisfy cosmological models are also satisfying this. And numerically also it's much more difficult because you have to apply pure GR there. Yes, yes. So That's recently, recently only people started to do and some of these uh, simulations are also very like approximate. Because, um, I mean, they take only very specific, because these are numerically very expensive. So people take a very narrow parameter range and then, or certain specific class, subclass of model and see what is the effect. So again, this is just starting to, you know, uh, like a growing field, let's say. Okay, Ari. Yeah, actually, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First one is, uh, you said that the neutron stars, the neutron stars have 
very high magnetic field. Mm-hmm. Can you say what is the origin if it is really? Magnetic? Yeah. So again, for normal neutron stars, mm-hmm. so you can imagine when they are being formed from a normal star. So there is a certain magnetic field. Mm-hmm. When it is collapsing because of magnetic flux conservation, the radius is decreasing, so the magnetic field will lower. So that is the reason why normal neutron stars have a high field. Already they have a high field, like 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 12 cross. But there are even a subclass called magnetars, for which we know that the surface fields are a thousand times stronger. So for these, again, there is a speculation, what is the origin? People think there might be an alpha omega dynamo kind of uh, you know process in which, again, people have done like magneto rotational instability um, simulations, but then there is some kind of doubt there also because usually they are not able to produce such strong field starting from a very low field. They have to start the simulation already from a high seed magnetic field. So it's not very clear, but most likely it is from some kind of a dynamo process that the fields become so large. Okay, and the second one is that the gravitation wave we have still till now detected are from the binary merge, but it is known that for individual isolated forces also there can be gravitational waves mm-hmm. for the deformation. But mm-hmm. if it is from the deformation of the surface sample, how can it give information about the pole? No, not all of them give information. So what I usually study is these oscillation nodes because they are sensitive to the pole. But for example, if it is from that mountain, then it is giving information only about the crust elasticity, mm-hmm. not the I mean, uh, What information? In the gravitation will be there from the core. That is so for the oscillation node, for example. So I mean, I have not given you a lot of details because this is more involved. But for example, if there are where did I put? 